everyone, and welcome to the Allergan Limitless Women's Leadership Podcast Series. We are grateful to Allergan for their unwavering support of this important initiative. This podcast series is dedicated to providing you with real-life stories of women in leadership who are tackling gender-related hurdles, large and small. The stories and topics covered will be as diverse as the group of women we represent. My name is Dr. Ashley Amalfi, and I'm a board-certified plastic surgeon at the Quetella Center for Plastic Surgery in Rochester, New York, and I'm going to be your host for today's episode. Today's episode is really exciting, you guys, and I am so excited for this diverse panel that we have. We have Drs. Lisa Souter, who's in Seattle, Washington, Dr. Sarah Troxell in Anchorage, Alaska, and Dr. Anu Bajaj in Oklahoma City. So we literally have all corners of the United States covered here, and we're here to come together to discuss a super hard topic. We're going to talk about addiction and sobriety and how it affects us personally and as families. So I want to thank you guys in advance. This is a super vulnerable topic, but a really important one. And honestly, I don't think one that's been really discussed amongst us as a group. And so I'm just so grateful for each of your voices. So I just want to start off by telling all of our listeners a little bit about ourselves as a plastic surgeon, where we are, where we practice, but then a little bit more about your personal story and how it relates to today's topic. So Dr. Souter, I'd love for you to go first and tell us a little bit about your story. I was in private practice in Seattle for 30 years, and I retired exactly one year ago. And I would recommend that everybody maxes out their 401k because retirement is awesome. (laughs) I love my work, but I'm on the other side now and I look forward. It's really, really nice to have some freedom and some leisure time. I experienced a lot of alcohol use and abuse really since high school years and into college, medical school. I was part of a drinking club in medical school, uh, general surgery residency, then through plastic surgery. And, you know, found about 12 years ago, I was just ready to uh, evaluate my drinking and maybe do something about it. And that's kind of when my sobriety journey started. So that's just kind of an intro to me. Do you want everybody else to just do their brief intro? Yeah, absolutely. Sarah, do you mind sharing your story? Not at all. Not at all. I was practicing for 27 years in Anchorage, Alaska, and I'm no longer practicing. I was in private practice and it was plastic and reconstructive. I would say probably slightly more reconstructive. I didn't have a history of alcohol use as a young person. I was born to two British parents who did not drink at home. Their parents and grandparents and great-grandparents were all alcoholics. It wasn't sort of a thing we talked about. It just wasn't available in the household unless it was a holiday, in which case you got to have a sip of champagne. Frankly, I didn't really like it when I was offered it. And I went to a partying school, college, and I went to parties occasionally, but I was a nerd. And I was in the library Mm -hmm. most Friday nights, and I would go for two hours on a Saturday maybe, but did not like the taste of beer, did not like the taste of alcohol. And when I got married and socialized, I would take a little sip, but I made a face and didn't want anybody to see my face. I started drinking in response to life events, I think. I also didn't have good experiences with alcohol. There were times that I got drunk in college, maybe a handful, and they were always in response to something bad happening in my world. And They always ended in a terrible headache and usually a blackout and should have been my red flag. Mm -hmm. In a new, your experience is a little bit different and from a, a unique perspective. Do you mind sharing a little bit about your story? Right. So I do drink. I mean, I drink wine and stuff, but I think my experience is more from a family perspective. I got married or remarried in 2009 and At the time, my husband, prior to us meeting, had been sober for a number of years. And then when we met and we were dating, he started drinking again. And then once we got married, he started drinking very, very heavily. And it was a very destructive way. It was drinking starting at 10 in the morning and continuing all day. And so within one year of my marriage, I was in a situation where I had to make 
an ultimatum or make a decision that either this marriage is not going to work because my husband is an alcoholic or he is going to get sober. And so my perspective is more as the spouse and my husband is sober. We actually have dealt and are still dealing with addiction within our children. My husband's father was an alcoholic and he is he truly believes there's some sort of a genetic component to all of that that plays a role because we've had experiences with our oldest son as well. Thank you. I think that's going to be a really unique perspective. And I similarly have a lot of very close family and friends who also deal with alcoholism and addiction and are living in recovery. And so it's going to be really interesting to talk about some of these issues and some of these problems and then just have so many different perspectives. So again, thank you guys all for being so open to it. You know, the first question I'm I'm wondering is, you know, Anu talked a little bit about how she was faced with a situation where her loved one really had an ultimatum and had to make a choice to get help. But I think that that's for our, our listeners, a really important step is, is how do you know you need help? And Lisa sort of suggested that maybe it was apparent for her from a very young age that she was drinking heavily and at a younger age. But for Sarah, it seemed like it was different, like a different pattern for you, more of a coping pattern. So how do you hit a point and who around you or what within you was really responsible for that initial decision to turn things around and to seek help? Well, I was a really, really highly functional, heavy drinker. I mm -hmm. mean, honor roll, got into med school, got a good surgery residency, plastic surgery. I mean, checked all those boxes. And yeah. I remember, you know, a dozen years ago when I really started thinking this is too much because mid afternoon would roll around at work. And all I could think about was that first glass of rosé when I mm -hmm. hit the door. I mean, it's all I could think about. Had three school age kids at home and you know, I'd go online and take these surveys. Are you an alcoholic? And honestly, most of my answers were no. I'd never had a DUI. That doesn't mean I drove drunk, but I never got caught. I did. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's always a wake up call. We um, should talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I never missed a day of work, never went through withdrawal. My husband is a wine connoisseur. It never caused any problems in my marriage. You know, I really didn't check any of the boxes, but I obsessed about that first drink when I would get home and I would pack away at least a bottle by myself and I'm not a big person. Mm -hmm. And I had a particular evening where there was a neighborhood party and I got pretty wasted. And the next day I was really hungover. It was a Sunday and couldn't eat anything all day because I felt so bad. And finally at dinner, we, you know, we sit down for dinner with our three young kids and I didn't feel good enough to eat, but I poured myself a great big, like nine ounce glass of wine. And that was my moment mm -hmm. where I thought, I'm sitting here with my three young kids. And the next day I went to my first AA meeting and didn't know anything about AA, didn't really know anything about the 12 step programs. And that was my turning point mm -hmm. where I'm like, you know, I can do this with help. And life has just gotten better and better ever since. Yeah, wow, that's pretty remarkable. So it was very much self-driven for you. How, yeah, what, really. And, yeah. you know, AA, I don't go much now, but I went every day for years and it just provides so much support and provides really a social interaction without alcohol. And in the circles we run in, that's unusual. And you learn to function and enjoy yourself without alcohol. My yeah. husband still goes to AA every morning. And I think when he goes, I feel like it's stabilizing for me too, because he goes at 5am. And that means that's where we start our days and how mm -hmm. we start it. That's awesome. And I have a son who's in his mid 20s. He is also in recovery. And he's very, very involved in AA. And he and I totally talk the AA language. And this probably isn't going to make the cut. But I think there should be an assholes anonymous because honestly, 
and a lot of our colleagues, especially our male colleagues, would benefit greatly from this because the principles of AA are just such a good way to structure your life. It was very life-changing for me. I agree. One of the things that you made me think of, Ashley, is talking about the differences in us. There is no cookie cutter for an alcoholic, and it doesn't matter what color your skin is, what sexual orientation you have, what financial background you have, what you do for a living. And that was one of the things that struck me from the when I went into my first meeting. I want to highlight the difference between some of the differences that I'm seeing between us. While I didn't drink much and my experiences drinking in college and residency were few and far between, they weren't good. And what happened to me was my partner in my practice was my husband. We trained together at Stanford and at a meeting for ultrasound assisted liposuction, my husband had a brain aneurysm pop. I did 25 minutes of CPR on him and he did not make it. And he was the father to my five-year-old, nine-year-old, 10-year-old, and my partner in my practice. He was my everything. And I didn't handle his death with grace in any way. I fell apart. I was filled with sadness and with anxiety, and I didn't know how to cope. And I had parents who had been raised to stiff upper lip. British parents. And when you have a problem, I'd had multiple miscarriages, a tubal pregnancy, a sexual assault, brush it under the rug. Don't deal with it. I never saw a therapist. I didn't need that. I was too tough for that. Mm -hmm. I never saw a therapist after my husband died. I sent my three kids to a therapist for two years after they died, but I didn't go to a therapist. I went to a psychiatrist once and he wanted to put me on meds. And I was like, I don't need meds. And what I ended up doing not planned, but I ended up self-medicating with alcohol. Mm -hmm. My mother suggested going back to work. I went back, you know, as soon as possible. Six weeks after my husband died, I went back to work. I did not know how to run the, the business because my husband did that. I dealt with the kids. He dealt with the practice. So I am blindly starting, thrown into the middle of running a practice, running the business aspect. I didn't know what bank we used. I didn't know what loans we had. My own fault. I was totally mm -hmm. uninformed. But it was like I was suddenly in business school and single-handedly raising these kids. It was like a nightmare, and I couldn't get out of it. And I was so filled with anxiety, I started having panic attacks. I didn't even believe panic attacks existed. I was like, if prior to having one myself, that's a terrible thing to admit, but it's the truth. Mm -hmm. I kind of was like, oh, come on, buck up. What's wrong with me? Like, that's what I thought. And... I had my first panic attack and I thought I was going to die. How alcohol came into it was our friends would come to the house and bring a bottle of wine and say, Sarah, all you do is go to work and to your kids' activities. You never leave the house. You can't be this way. It was about a year after my husband died, maybe a little bit more. And so they would bring a bottle of wine and I would have a glass. Meanwhile, every time I took a sip, I would turn away, make a face and then act like everything was great because I didn't like the taste. It was like medicine, but I took it and I drank more. And after a glass, my anxiety was decreased. I wasn't so sad. I could barely hear his name without bawling. Mm -hmm. And the glass would make me feel better. Well, then it took two glasses. Then it took three. Then people weren't coming over. My kids were in bed. I found myself drinking at home, but it wasn't drinking at home if I was picking up the phone and calling my friend or my brother. And that's what I ended up doing. And what happened yeah, I, my bottom came very quickly, thank the Lord. My bottom came with a drive home from our cabin and being pulled over by a state trooper. Oddly enough, the husband of a reconstruction patient of mine, a breast reconstruction patient of mine who almost didn't arrest me because I saved his wife. I reconstructed her and made her whole again. And, you know, a few months after I got out of Betty Ford, I brought him a Christmas gift and a thank you card for arresting me because he saved my life. He saved my kid's life, in my opinion. So I was arrested, stood in a jail cell. My bottom was that and the shame of that, being groped by a woman in the jail cell for 12 hours and getting out 
getting into a cab and I made that phone call to Betty Ford. Mm -hmm. I knew to call there because my brother had two years prior gone through Betty Ford. Then I called the chairman of the state medical board to tell him myself. And he said, Sarah, you know, my husband was on the state medical board before he died. He said, Sarah, I've been at functions with you. You barely drink anything. I said, yeah, that was then. And this isn't now. Trust me. Yeah. But he did like a reverse intervention on me, kind of. Hmm. Called three colleagues to tell them that my patients were going to need to be covered because I was going into Betty Ford the next day. Also, reverse interventions. You don't have a problem. We know you. Yes, I do. I'll see you in three months. It was the hardest thing I ever did and the best thing I ever did. And I, so I checked myself into Betty Ford the next day. I had three children, five, nine, 10. They each went to a brother. I was so blessed to have three brothers who would take each one of them, had made that, those arrangements, had a wonderful friend in Anchorage who helped me do that. And I went to Betty Ford and Betty Ford was just a lifesaver to me. They had trauma counseling, grief counseling, all the things that I'd swept under the rug that I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. I finally got to deal with. I got to take care of Sarah for the first time in my life. I had previously, you know, how it is, all of you, mm -hmm. you take care of your patients, you take care of your family, you take care of your kids, you take care of your spouse. And you somehow, or at least for me, I can, I guess I should only speak for myself. I got sort of brushed aside and didn't take care of me. And I found tools to deal with my sadness, to deal with life's disappointments that I previously didn't have in my arsenal. I did not want to leave Betty Ford. I actually told Dr. Harry, who ran the program, that if I didn't have three kids at home, I would have gone out and gotten drunk just so that they would keep me because it was that welcoming and needed for me. And then I went home and, oh, I should say, Betty Ford has a program for children and my children spent a week at Camp Betty. Mm -hmm. but that's what we called it at our house. And they learned about addiction because given that I have since then now another brother who's in the program, but three brothers, myself, grandparents, great grandparents, there is a familial aspect to this disease. And I also had to recognize and admit and agree or begin to believe that this was a disease. I didn't prior, I mean, I was very judgmental about alcoholism, to be honest, just like I didn't believe their anxiety attacks existed. I was like, oh, he's an alcoholic, like very judgmental. And that's how a lot of the world still is about it. And I didn't recognize it was a disease till I had it myself. And I was blessed that I came back to a practice that still existed, that my patients still had faith in me, that my colleagues still had faith in me. That was big. I appreciate so much you telling that very heart-wrenching story and being so vulnerable. I think it's going to resonate with so many of our listeners. So thank you for being so honest. And I'm sorry for everything you've gone through and congratulate you on being such an incredibly strong woman. It's an amazing amazing story and probably such a wonderful example to your children. And that's kind of what I was going to ask from here. Like even as a physician who's trained and taught about addiction, I still feel like until you experience it firsthand, it's really hard to understand. And as someone who's not an addict or an alcoholic, I still feel like I have so much to learn. And every time I feel like I'm kind of get it, it I'm reminded very clearly by someone who does have addiction that I, I actually don't get it at all. And so I think that for me, and I don't know if you feel like that, a new that's been a really hard thing to deal with. And so that, that idea of reverse intervention that you brought up, Sarah, I feel like I see that often. And at least I know enough to recognize that in other people who kind of downplay alcoholism and those around me. And so I was wondering if the rest of you guys have those kind of experiences. I see you shaking your head anew. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I remember, so my husband has a great degree of discipline and he would drink. And then when he would drink, his mood would change. But like he was, as Lisa described, completely functional. He could drink all night and still get up because he's a cross country coach and run with his team at six in the morning without any consequence. So very functional. And it was interesting because 
our turning point was for Lent, he gave up alcohol. And so he didn't drink for 40 days. And then right afterwards, it was like what I would have to describe as five continuous days of not being sober at all to the point where I had to lock up his keys so that he wouldn't drive anywhere. And I was trying to, at my wits end, trying to figure out what to do. And I called my dad and my dad's like, he's not an alcoholic. I saw him. He didn't drink at all for 40 days for Lent, (laughs) which was not the point. But anyway, that was our turning point. And what I realized actually at that point in time is there's not a whole lot of resources that we have available to us to treat somebody or to manage somebody in that situation where they're not sober and potentially violent as well. And it was just a big learning experience. And so how hard was it for you to like have that discussion about getting help? Was that like an easy conversation? Did it kind of trickle in or did So I locked up his keys. This was in June and the boys were home for summer and like the boys would call me and I'd be in the OR and they'd say, you know, the phone would ring and the circulator would say, Anu, it's your son or stepson or whatever. And they would say, Anu, what do we do? I was like, don't worry, his keys are locked up. And they're like, he's going crazy. And what I ended up doing was I reached out to several friends and colleagues who knew because I didn't know if he needed inpatient or what to do. And so there was a counselor that dealt with addiction and some of the well-known executives in town and was doing a research project. And I was able to get him in for that. And then that's, so he went and was counseling for two years and has been an AA ever since. And, but it was like, you had to make phone calls and figure out what to do. Cause it's not, it's not something we talk about because there is so much stigma to it. So the resources aren't as obvious Yeah. And and sometimes I think that that stigma as a physician is almost worse. I mean, like you said, to get where we get, we have to be the best of the best at everything we do and to be fallible and human and to have like something that we cannot control sometimes I think is a really hard hurdle for someone in a professional career. Did you, Lisa and Sarah, feel that way or? When you quit drinking, you notice how alcohol saturated everything is. I mean, all the meetings Mm -hmm. and, you know, I've really learned to set boundaries. And honestly, something that, that I have learned is in a social situation, hardly anybody even notices whether you're drinking or not, because all they care about is their own drink. (laughs) And almost in every situation, you can find somebody else drinking Perrier or a Diet Coke. Mm-hmm. It's a Diet Coke. And, you know, bingo, there's another person that you can chat with. And I'm kind of living a reverse intervention. My husband is a wine connoisseur and he makes wine in our basement. We have four French barrels of wine in our basement. Wow. And he has a huge group of friends. Wine making is very labor intensive. It requires a lot of people and he makes very good wine. He gets great grapes from central Washington. And he has probably half a dozen events at our house every year. And I would rather it not be that way, but that is who he is. And he lost his most reliable drinking buddy, which was me. It's a strain on our marriage, but we power through it. He has friends come over who, you know, get really wasted. And I have found that I'm getting pretty good at just kind of removing myself from situations. And honestly, when everybody's wasted, nobody even notices if you leave. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've gotten really good at that. Not only it functions at our house, but if we go out to a party or something, I'm great for like the first 90 minutes. And then if you're not drinking, things start getting loud and obnoxious. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's like, okay, you know, Nick can take an Uber home. I'm out of here. And that's just our understanding. And yeah, so you just really notice how alcohol saturated polite society is. Mm -hmm. And I... Oh my God, I get so sick of hearing these conversations about this wine and that wine and blah, blah, blah. 
I mean, I've told my husband, it's like me talking about cats all the time because I love cats. And, you know, or like me wanting you to go to a cat show, you would just hate it, you know, and... Except cats can't kill him. No. Well, actually, it, it depends on the cat. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I know what you mean. And, I mean, I, I feel like I've gotten very, very little support from my husband with my sobriety. I've gotten a tremendous amount of support from my son who is also in recovery and then i have two other uh, young adult children one doesn't drink at all she's my daughter and she has some vestibular neuritis issues and a little vertigo and just it just doesn't agree with her and then my other son is a total what we call a normie as opposed to an alky and that he can leave half a beer on the table and just walk away from it that's something i could never do but, you know, I've just learned to set boundaries and then there's always alcohol pushers out there and you just have to tell them to lay off. And in two instances in the last year, they both have been at functions. One was my retirement party where an employee's husband was like, you're not even going to have a glass of champagne at your own party. What's wrong with you? And blah, blah, blah. And the other was at a Northwest Society of Plastic Surgeons meeting in February. Another husband, it's always a guy. Can I get you a drink? Come on, let me get you a drink. Let me get you a drink. And, you know, I have found that the best approach with those kind of people is like, look, I'm a recovering alcoholic and I'm not going to relapse to make you feel comfortable. And that's a great answer. That just, that's a know, great answer. Yeah. That just shuts them down. And then I say, if you're ever interested in exploring sobriety, give me a call. And, and then what they, happens? They walk away. And yeah. then, but they don't bother you anymore. Yeah, so. that's great. That's brilliant. Yeah. Sarah, do you have advice for those situations? Because there's definitely those people who are like, why aren't you drinking? Or what are you drinking? Like, why do you care what I'm drinking? Why are you drinking a club soda or something? Or what, like that, you know, yeah. like what else is in there? Just tonic. And what else? Like, why do you care? You know, or if you order a ginger beer at dinner, they're like, with what? Just a ginger beer, you know, it's just a ginger ale and a fancy vehicle. But <clears throat> how do you deal with it, Sarah? Well, I don't have the same experience again. Everybody who knows me knows I'm a recovering alcoholic. Nobody ever offers me alcohol. At first, when I came out of rehab, some friends who didn't, well, you know, it was just because John died and blah, blah, blah. But I have not had that experience, really. What I was going to talk about, actually, was about the unique position we are as physicians to as physicians when faced with the disease of addiction and we're handicapped and it's not something people talk about much but we're used to being perfect passing the test getting into the college getting into the medical school and i cannot tell you the shame i had when i found myself in that jail cell and when the first dozen maybe two dozen times i had to say Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm an alcoholic. I couldn't say it without bawling. My first few meetings, every time I spoke, I, was, I literally was bawling the whole time because I was so filled with shame. Letting all the people down in my world, letting my patients down, letting my staff down, letting my colleagues down, letting my kids down. I mean, the list went on. It was massive. And I felt just so awful. Then you have everything about your fall or your bottom is about the consequences, right? So now you're in private practice, which, you know, there are still unicorns out there that, or I guess they call them dinosaurs who are in solo practice. I was in solo practice courtesy of my husband dying. And I had a overhead. I had all my staff and my insurance, which was Blue Cross Blue Shield, didn't pay for it. And you have the financial aspect to it. And I paid my staff for three months while I wasn't there because I couldn't think of coming back to new people or hiring new people and training them. So there was that financial aspect and there's no support for that part of it. The insurance let me down. What was available and which I grabbed onto was with every state medical board, there's a health care committee that deals with addiction, that is there to support. They're part of the state medical association, but they're a liaison with the medical board. 
And so this committee is made up of typically psychiatrists, internal medicine doctors, therapists, and they are involved in the monitoring of the person who comes out of rehab and make sure that they do urine testing, make sure that they go to AA meetings regularly. Typically patients are, or physicians are reported to the state medical board and the state medical board mandates that you're followed by this committee. In my case, nobody was mandating me to do anything, but the recommendation I had from Dr. Harry at Betty Ford was, you declare that you have an issue, you just left Betty Ford and you sign up. So I did random urine tests once a week. When you sign up, you do it for five years. I did it until I retired. You give them a weekly report of how many AA meetings you went to, and you have it signed off on every time you went to go to an AA meeting. It's essentially from the way Dr. Harry explained it to me was it's your insurance policy. And then he said, I know you didn't have a drug problem, but you were arrested and you were in the newspaper. So your patients know whether you tell them or not, people know. Alaska is very small. Everybody knows everybody. So that was part of my fear of, am I going to have a practice to go back to? And I was blessed that I did, but I knew that people knew. So if a patient comes in, she has a breast reduction and one nipple is two millimeters higher than the other. Well, she was drunk, clearly. Right. And and then we have a case. There's so. Did you, did you face that Sarah or just hypothetical? I didn't, but that was a concern of Mm -hmm. mine. And I think a valid one. The, a competitor in town, a guy in town, a plastic surgeon in town told everybody who would listen that I was an alcoholic. Didn't you hear? She got a DUI. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So my insurance policy was I not only peed in a cup for urine, every drug, the entire panel every week, which mm-hmm. also costs a lot of money, but it was well <laughs> worth it to me. So if the patient says, you know, my nipple is two millimeters higher than the other, she must be drinking. Oh, here's my alcohol testing. And oh, well, then it was something else. Now I can show them the drug testing. Now, I, again, I never had to show that, but there was also some security for me. I knew that I was going to be called at some stage. I was going to get the beep saying I had to go get the testing. It's not the reason I didn't drink, but I kind of am one of those people where a condom, a diaphragm, and the pill is the best way to not get pregnant. You know, like that's how I, Yeah. when I was in that jail cell, I envisioned losing my practice, but more importantly, losing those three kids or that those kids would end up on the street or, you know, drug addicts or in jail because their only parent was an alcoholic who was out of control. And if I hadn't been arrested, who knows where, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I have one other thing that I wanted to share that happened at Betty Ford. There was a day that we were all sitting around and Dr. Harry said to you, okay, we're going to play a game. Here are 10 pieces of paper, write down the 10 most important things in your world. The things that are the most important things to you. And, you know, people write down friends, children, family, my profession, blah, blah, blah. And people wrote down sobriety. And then he said, okay, you can only keep seven of them. Three of them have to go in the garbage. I'm not doing this exactly how he did it because I can't remember the exact words, but three have to go in the garbage and so on and so on until you're only left with one thing. And I had in my hand a piece of paper with my children and sobriety. And one of them had to go in the trash. And I threw my children in the trash. And that says it all. If I don't have my sobriety, I have nothing. And I know too many people from the group that were there. I, on June 18th is my sobriety date and I'll have 15 years. My sobriety occurred. So I had my DUI the day after my husband's two-year anniversary. And it was also Father's Day. That's Mm -hmm. when I got my DUI. Mm -hmm. And as this approaches, I think to myself, what a beautiful thing that arrest was. It's the craziest thing in the world. At the time, I thought my world had fallen apart. It was the most horrific thing. I was the kid who got straight A's. I was the kid who never snuck out of the house, who never cheated on anything, never, you know, like that person. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of women in this group who can relate to that. 
you know, and I never rebelled until I was 42 years old and I got a freaking DUI. Mm -hmm. And what I haven't shared so far with you, and I should, to, for complete honesty, I had my child, my oldest child in the car and his best friend who was then, but became even more so like my third son. Mm -hmm. And they witnessed me arrested and taken away in handcuffs. That's what it took for me. And as I say, it went really fast, my downfall, but yeah. Do you think if you didn't have the kids in the car, it would have been as powerful, Sarah? Or what, do you think oh, that was? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. I mean, that was, that just made the shame so much worse. Mm -hmm. But, you know, facing your colleagues and your staff and admitting this, honestly, facing the tattooed bikers the first time was, I, I was ashamed to admit to them. Mm -hmm. And I also didn't, you know, we talked about relating to people and people, everybody being different. I remember going to my first meeting in Palm Springs and thinking, I have nothing in common with this, these dudes, like what? Mm -hmm. And all those people, every single one had something, I could relate to something. A lot of addicts feel like they don't belong or like they have to have alcohol to feel a part of. That was never me. I always felt a part of, I never felt the need to have alcohol. Mine's a different story, but there's so many different stories that bring you to the same place. Mm -hmm. And it really, everybody's story is interesting and important, but no different and no better. You know what I mean? Like we, we all have the same disease. Yeah. As a group of women and as women who all have families, I think we should talk a little bit about how this affects families, how this, you know, we talked a little bit of Lisa about how it's affected your marriage and we've talked about the kids kind of peppered throughout, but I would love to know a little bit more about what that journey has been like for your children. And when you have young children and they see their, their parent going through something like this, how and when do you have a candid discussion with them about addiction? And then how do you keep that conversation ongoing as they grow up? I think the first few months of sobriety, I think were the hardest on my kids because I was just angry at the world. And again, you know, not really getting any support from my husband. You know, I would sit down and he'd pour himself a glass of wine. And my husband is actually a really awesome, wonderful guy. And I'm making him sound terrible, but I wouldn't marry to him if, if he weren't awesome. He's just, this is a blind spot for him. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, my kids, they, they were like in grade school then. And, you know, it's like, God, why is mom such a bitch, you know? And <laughs> then it, it gets better. And I really got so much support and insight at my AA meetings. And Sarah's story with the DUI, I bet maybe between... 25 and 30 percent of people that were in my AA meetings that's how they got there was with the DUI mm -hmm. and they come to cherish their DUI because it was the beginning of their new life of sobriety as my kids got older one of my sons really got into he really fell down the addiction rabbit hole in late high school and I'm happy to report that he's got five years now. And it's funny, my husband and I, we were kind of in denial what was happening. The other two kids kind of knew a lot more about it than we did. And I was very, very lucky in that my son came asking for help. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody can overcome an addiction unless they want to. I don't think you can force it on people. Mm -hmm. And my son went into treatment and has just become the most awesome young man. And you can just see the 12 steps just shining through him. And he is much more socially adept and skilled than his non-addicted brother is. Uh, it's really interesting. Um, I think that my other son should go to that other... A, a meeting that, <laughs> that is a different word and then our daughter she was pretty young when I really got sober and you know we talk about it and she's a senior in college now and 
She had a lot of friends go into the Greek system and oh my God, her stories are just unbelievable. Her mm -hmm. friends just, you know, getting wasted all the time. And she's just a really sensible kid that is mm -hmm. not interested in drinking. It makes her vertigo worse. And we call her our Mormon in the family. And having spent six years in Utah doing general surgery, I love Mormons. They're awesome. <laughs> but I think that my journey has allowed me to talk not only just about drugs and alcohol and other things. It has allowed me to talk about a lot of kind of dark stuff with my kids comfortably. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like they can tell me anything. And I just don't shy away from tough topics. Mm -hmm. And Anu, did you have those conversations with the boys? Or those are conversations that maybe your husband had with them? And then how has it been sort of experiencing it from the other side for your husband with what your family deals with? So Trevor had those conversations. I mean, he's been very open about it. Each of the boys has been to an AA meeting at some mm -hmm. point in their lives with him. Our oldest is the one that has struggled with addiction and was in rehab a total of three times from after the age of 17 onwards. So other than that, it's been a very honest conversation. And the older boys will sometimes joke that there is definitely a genetic predisposition and they will mm -hmm. say that they can't handle alcohol like their peers can. Like there's some biochemical reaction and they all act the same way that is just so in inappropriate. And I could see it in the boys. And so it's been a very honest discussion about what they can and can't do. And I think that's the only way you can do it is to have an honest discussion. And I agree with what Lisa and Sarah have said is it's not something you can force on anybody. It has to come from within. I think Trevor's wake up call was just that instead of a DUI, it was, okay, is this marriage going to work or not? Mm -hmm. And that was what it was. But I think you have to be open and upfront about it. And that's what I valued when I met Sarah for the first time 14 or 15 years ago. It was not anything she hid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's got to be a really hard thing to do, but also equally powerful. You know, I told you the first dozen, two dozen times mm -hmm. I said those words, Sarah, I'm Sarah, I'm an alcoholic. It was so hard. And then it got just so easy and it was like a, the floodgates opened and it mm -hmm. was like, you know what? I'm going to shout from the mountaintop. And, and I also knew that there was power in that. Mm -hmm. I was told that by Dr. Harry, pretty much if he told me to stick my head in a fire, I would have done it. The guy is an addiction guru. He's so good. And he, he taught me so many things and gave me advice. He didn't tell me what to do, but Another trick, and you asked about children. So they had what I call Camp Betty. You go for a week. You actually have to sit with a counselor and you face the child. It was two years after my husband died. So I had a seven-year-old, an 11-year-old, and a 12-year-old. And I had to apologize to them. They had to tell me what they had noticed about me. Now, they never had to like get me to bed or my oldest boy was in the car. But it wasn't a thing that they saw a lot of or saw it all really. Mm -hmm. But the fact that I got arrested impacted them. The fact that they had to spend three months without me, they already lost their father. Now their children, they're like, what the hell? Now we have no parents. It was, you know, that was awful. So uh, there was all that that we had to deal with, but we had to explain to them that they're at risk. And there's a whole program that they have set up for young people where they explain about familial tendencies towards this, et cetera. I believe their father had the disease. Well, that's actually another part that I do want to talk about doctors fearing going and getting help. Mm -hmm. That's not part of your question right now, but it is something that should be in this, I would say. But as far as the children, when they got home, Dr. Harry said, you know, this is a process for them and for you. They are at risk, but I think that the 12-step program, like Lisa said, it's something that I believe every single person on this planet could benefit from a 12-step program. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be addicted to benefit from it. And there was something we did in our houses. The women were in, I think there were seven of us in each house. And at the end of the night, we went to the big book. I have what 
is says in the big book, but I know what we did because it was sort of tweaked for children. You know how at the dinner table you say to your kids, how was your day? Fine. Yeah. What did you do? Nothing. What was your, you know, that's, you know what I'm talking about, right? Of course. Yeah. Well, this nip that in the bud so fast because the questions are very pointed. What was the best part of your day? What was the worst part of the day? What could you have done better? Mm-hmm. Do you have any resentments? Is there somebody you need to apologize to? And mm-hmm. the list goes on. And every night we went in a circle at dinner. Every night we did this for the first two years that I was home. Then as p- kids started to go and do, you know, they were involved in this activity, that activity. And the kids would sometimes say, you know, we need a 12 step. And I'd be like, <laughs> what? <laughs> and, or one would go off to college. The first kid goes off to college and they come back. And the first thing they want to do the first night for dinner is they want to have that 12 step. It's a check-in and it's mm-hmm. a check-in that's genuine and honest and is there anybody you've been dishonest to? Have you been kind and loving to everybody? You know, d- this is reviewing your day. And it, as I say, that was, my kids have said to me, they've written it in Mother's Day, in Father's Day cards. They've written it to me in birthday cards. That was such a gift to them. Probably more than anything I ever gave them. That one thing I did with them. hmm Mm -hmm. it's really many things honestly I mean honestly you guys this has been such an amazing hour and if it's okay with all of you I really think that it deserves a part two if you can commit because I think that there's just so many other topics that we can kind of continue to cover and I really want to talk about like how to you know how to get help and how to offer help and and I think that those are real resources that I think we should really provide our listeners. But again, I just want to thank you all for your your honesty and and being so candid and vulnerable and and sharing your story. And if you each want to just end with a quick word of advice for anyone who is themselves dealing with addiction and or dealing with addiction in a loved one just just some quick advice for our listeners and then we'll stay tuned for some more big topics because I think this is a conversation that should have happened a long time ago and never has. And I'm, I'm just so grateful to all of you for getting it started. My advice is if you think you have a drinking problem or a substance abuse problem, don't go to the internet and take a survey. If you think <laughs> you have a problem, you have a problem. And once you're on the other side of it, it's just so good. Life just gets better. And 12-step programs, there are many open ones where you don't have to be afflicted of the addiction to attend. Mm-hmm. And 12-step programs are all over the place. And I just really feel that my life just got so much better becoming part of that community. And yeah, it's almost a gift. In fact, it is a gift. It is a gift to be in recovery. I would agree with Lisa. And I would say to anybody listening to this, that my number is 907-250-3614. And if you think you have a problem and you want to talk to somebody, call me. Because I would understand, I would relate. And and I think that I did have an orthopedic surgeon down the street, a husband of a friend of mine, who I was able to go to the first meeting in Anchorage with. And that made all the world of difference. And, And I think... No, it's scary, but I know that fear. And so does Lisa. And we actually, service is a huge part of AA. And it's unusual to ask somebody in AA to do something, even if it's kind of a big deal and have them say no. Mm -hmm. It's a rare thing that I say no to somebody. I'm somewhat jealous of that community. It sounds amazing to have that. Like that's just something so special that I'm sure permeates all parts of your life. And it's so evident and just listening to the way that you both speak and your self-awareness and it really does seem like a gift. So thank you. Anu, any parting words? I would just reiterate that there is help. And if anybody has concerns or questions to reach out to any of us, I think the important is that we support each other in a non-judgmental way. And alluding to what Sarah said about the service aspect, I see that with my husband. He will go out of his way and help people. And being an AA for the past 12 years has been the best thing that ever happened to our marriage, just because 
like everybody's talked about, the 12 steps permeate far beyond just addiction. It's just a way of life. And Mm -hmm. those are the things we talk about in the same way that Sarah said that she brought it home to her kids. And I think it makes a huge difference in how you approach life. Yeah. And Al-Anon is something that hasn't been brought up here as well, but that's a 12-step program for loved ones of uh, people who have addiction. And it's an excellent way to just help understand and form your own community to, to deal with yourself because you can't control an addict. You just can control yourself and how you react to it Mm. and how you move forward from there. And so I think that's an important step and something we can certainly talk more about in the future. But again, I want to thank you all so much for such a powerful and honest discussion. And I look forward to spending more time with each of you in the future. So everyone Thank you so much for tuning in to this Allergan Limitless Women's Leadership Podcast Series. We are so grateful today to Dr. Sauder, Dr. Troxel, and Dr. Bajaj for their honesty today. And we look forward to you guys tuning in for more podcasts in the future. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you.